you you've seen the thing where like people on Facebook are posting pictures of themselves ten years ago and today. There, yeah. There's all this stuff going around now about how like well now AIs are just using that to train facial recognition algorithms and and all this kind of crap and I can't help but think that <sighs> you know in, in all the ways that I've known that you know artificial intelligence is going to take over the world and destroy us. You know, looking at the pictures of me in college was not the way I thought that was going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome to January, everybody, the end of January. You're listening to the Drunken UX podcast. This is episode number 28, where we will be talking about the wild world of usability. Wow. You're, you're going to wait till we get to 50. What noise are you going to make then? You can't say wow anymore. I'm going to go, oh, <laughs> and be like, okay. And if you want, anybody wants to send in a resume and application for co-host position, I burnt <laughs> this one out. He's done and taken care of. So we, we need a new one. We'll talk about, we'll be talking about usability tonight. I am mm. your host, Michael Feenan. A co-host or host hostess. Other host. Hostess. <laughs> Hostettes. Not the way that works. Uh, maybe, uh, Aaron Hill and. You should connect with us on social on facebook.com slash drunken UX and twitter.com slash drunken UX as well as instagram.com slash the drunken. No. Is it drunken yeah, UX no podcast the. or the drunken UX? Just drunken UX podcast on Instagram. Also connect with us at drunken UX.com slash slack to chat with us on there. And I think we have a YouTube channel. Are we still doing oh, stuff yes. up on that? Every episode. Yeah. Uh, every episode of the Drunken UX podcast and build process, not real time overview. Although I may change right. that, I may revisit yeah. that idea with the new RTO format. That may make more sense than it used to. I don't know. I'll think about that. Right. Depends on how timely that stuff goes. And a shout out to our lovely sponsors over at New Cloud. They do interactive mapping. If you're on a university or a hospital or a city or any kind of place that needs a map, give them a shout. They are at newcloud.com. Uh, slash drunken ux use the slash drunken ux so they know that we sent you there and all of that good stuff um and besides that let's see oh i am drinking because i'm drinking for the drinking user experience i'm i'm hoping that it will soothe my voice a little bit because <laughs> i was i was lucky enough fortunate enough to be at the last chiefs game which is oh you know, not the championship depending on when you're listening to this so i don't know what the outcome of the championship is yet but we just won our divisional <laughs> round we destroyed the cult i was up in the stands screaming my head off and my voice is still <laughs> recovering a little bit so i apologize if i'm a little uh, raspy this evening um but i'm trying to fix that i've got some glenfiddich tonight um, my bottle of choice is a uh, like a, a special run uh, bottling that they did called Fire and Cane. Um, hmm. It's a cane, cane like sugar cane or cane like getting smacked. Uh, no, cane very much like sugar cane. Um, the okay. wood flavor, uh, oddly enough, comes from the cask, not like a stick. Uh, oh, what okay. it's worth. Yeah, it's also very hard to store enough whiskey inside a cane to. You know, make a bottle. <laughs> I was thinking you put the cane inside of the, the keg or the <laughs> cask, I mean. like a, as a stave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a it, it's a non age statement um, scotch that they make it smoky, but hmm. rummy, um, sweet. Oh, interesting. It's huh. It's not bad. It's it, you know, it, it's a very if you, if you're interested in having a smoky scotch that isn't peaty. Like say an Ardbeg or mm. a Laphroaig or Talisker, I like okay. for a smoky Scotch. I like a Highland Park. Um, Highland mm -hmm. Park is a little bit more pricey. This I think it was only like thirty five dollars or something for a bottle. It was hmm. extremely wow. affordable. Um, not complex though. Uh, yeah, Fire and Cane, you know, smoky and sweet is pretty much exactly how it tastes. It doesn't <laughs> like you. You can't. You don't sit here and be like, ooh, I have. Mm, caramely notes with marmalade. And, like, right. No, it's just kind of smoky and sweet. Like, that's really all there is to it. And that's, I'm not saying that in a bad way. I, I do kind of like it. Um, it's just a simple type of flavor. Like, if you like scotch, 
But you also really like Chipotle sauce. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got a. I've had this before. I've got Angel's Envy again tonight. Oh. I re reopened that bottle recently, and nice. Um, it's a it's a good just I think all around like whiskey. Yeah, it's just a nice. It's it's it has, a very sweet yeah. bourbon. Yeah, it's, yeah, I would, yeah. It's got a very nice sweet sort of flavor to it. I'd all I I don't I'd put it more mm. like to compare it to Scotch like almost like a Highland Scotch, um, mm. but without obviously being Scotch because it's bourbon, <laughs> right? And I think it is actual bourbon too, not like I believe it is actually made in Bourbon County. Yeah, Kentucky. it's it's rye, isn't it? I yeah. think it's that's all bourbon has to be rye. I think so. I I forget. Like, uh, you ask me Scotch. I can I can tell you Scotch inside and out. But I get fuzzy <laughs> on the burns. You got corn. You got rye. You know, there's all these different right. um, grains you can do it from. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, you heard about um, we we talked a while back, right? About Microsoft buying GitHub. That was yeah. one of our uh, starter topics of choice. I seem to recall. But um, you heard what they just did. Yes, they made private repos free um and i know that because i i was paying for it to paying for a premium access to have private repos and now i don't have to anymore yeah. it it's an impressive move and i think that uh it definitely is a middle finger to a lot of the people who are like microsoft bought <laughs> github it's going to be terrible now give give them time that's a bold move on their part right cuz it's, it's a revenue stream, obviously, for them. Well, uh, what is it? Bitbucket and then GitLab. I, the main reason to use GitLab up to this point was because GitLab let you have unlimited private right. repos. And so this is like definitely a, a very competitive stance against those um, other repository platforms. And, and GitLab's cool because, I mean, GitLab, you could use their platform just like you would GitHub or Bitbucket. Mm-hmm. They were really compelling because you could also host your own Git with it. Yeah, that's right. They, you could have the GitLab, uh, what would be similar to the GitHub Enterprise, but you could have it with GitLab and it, without having to pay the crazy licensing yeah. fees. Um, I had used Bitbucket up until now. Uh, I mean, I use GitHub, mm-hmm. GitHub for most things, but for private repos, because um, myself and a ton of other people I know, um, if you mm-hmm. had a .edu email address when you signed up for Bitbucket, they gave you unlimited right. private repos. And that was huge. That's cool. Yeah, I like it when they do uh, that. Yeah, it was simple. You know, you just signed up with your, if you had a .edu email address that you could confirm, mm-hmm. then they gave that to you. And, I mean, that was a huge heads up, was particularly over GitHub. I didn't mm-hmm. use it for everything, mostly because... You know, I've got logins tied to GitHub, you know, with other tools and things right. like that. My <laughs> team at work uses GitHub. So, you know, just it made sense for that. But every once in a while I had, especially, you know, like WordPress themes that I'm using for my own mm-hmm. stuff. I tend to keep in a private repo just because I'm ashamed of them. Um, <laughs> almost got them to spit out as Angel's <laughs> Envy. <laughs> but now I don't have to. Now I could, I could move all that into GitHub, just have it all in GitHub. There are limitations. Yeah, that's it's uh with the integrations, right? Like you you have um I actually didn't see the specifics on that, like what kinds of integrations you can't do with the free platform. The the pro great GitHub Pro or whatever they're calling it. Um, you know, yeah. they've got more or any options for like continuous integration, um, or uh, right. like, you know, check styles and things like that and code review. Right. Um I think some of that's that isn't included with the the free version. Okay. They also have like a lot of insight information and metrics that yeah. come into your code. I I don't know like I I haven't compared them myself, so I don't know like how granular those get. Um, but you know if yeah. you're hosting an open source project, you probably aren't going to know nearly as much about you know your users and your forks and all of that probably than mm-hmm. what you would otherwise. The big thing is that you're limited to three contributors on a private repo. Right. It it, se- it seems like the, the their target their audience segmentation has changed to be projects or uh, GitHub users who just want to have like the ability to have a cloud based repo like for whatever thing they're working on versus the segment of 
businesses or users that are using it for professional uses. Yeah, yeah cuz team and enterprise uh accounts are still, you know, what they've always been. And the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is like at least with my personal usage, um the the private repos you know, I could do without them, you know, if I had to. Um yeah. cuz I use them for a theme, you know, and I'm not trying to get 12 if if I'm doing like let's say an open source project, well, a it's not going to be a private repo anyway. Right. Um, you know, if I'm doing anything private, it's probably because I'm doing development for somebody else. But if that's the case, mm -hmm. they probably have an enterprise or a team account anyway. So there's a there's a lot yeah. of that like for the individual user, I'm I'm not sure you know, and I, I guess maybe the I, I I don't guess we probably don't get to know what the revenue is off the the product in that way. But <laughs> you know, the the proof will be in the, in the pudding, so to speak. That if they can afford to do this, then I think it's certainly a good move, and I think it's a move that will mm -hmm. bring people like me away from Bitbucket because it's one less tool I have to use now. I think that's that's probably what the intent is: is market capture. Yeah. I don't think that there's any gotchas with this specifically. I'm I'm curious to see what what the next thing is. Like so they they've done this first thing. What is the next direction they're going to push this in? And I think that will kind of determine like what the intent of this was. Yeah. Well, if you're if you haven't heard about this or you're interested in in learning more, we'll have a link in the show notes um to an article over at the register about this, but of course, Google it whatever um then mm -hmm. it it's all over the news, so Oh, but but really quick, uh, do we have a list of like re whether or not you should downgrade? Did you not, you said you weren't on private before, but you just switched from Bitbucket. Yeah, I just I just moved my stuff over from Bitbucket. If if you have a preview account currently and you downgrade to private, it will prompt you with a "This is what will change with your account" thing. Are you sure? And then yes or no. So it's um, if you're use, just using it basically, like you can probably downgrade safely. And it's no big deal. And if you've already paid for the month, you will finish out your month as premium before it bumps you down. And I, I pulled up here while you were saying that, because that's a, that was a good thought. It, it's GitHub Pro comes with unlimited collaborators, obviously, but also GitHub Pages. Um, so if you're using Pages, oh, right. that's, that is limited to Pro. Um, wikis. I've used them a couple times with projects, but I generally find them not real useful, frankly. Protected branches, code owners, and then the repository insights. So, most of it's stuff that would be like very team oriented. Yeah, yeah, very, so very much. If it's just you and a buddy working on an app or something, you're probably fine with free for now. Yeah. So let us know. Uh, are you going to switch? Do you, you know, is it something that's going to get you away from Bitbucket or GitLab? Um, I'd be interested to hear. Mm -hmm. Tonight, the big uh, subject is in. We, uh, Aaron and I have been talking about this idea of, you know, doing some book reviews on the show, and we've got some uh, some things lined up for that. Um, this isn't that, although it is kind of that <laughs> in a very roundabout <laughs> way. The, the thing is, you know, we're the Drunken UX podcast, and we emphasize that, you know, the UX part of Drunken UX is more of its user experience, but we're talking about your experience with us as, as the listener. You're the user. Uh, <laughs> because we can't talk about usability every week. We don't want to talk about usability every week. This week, however... Right. We are talking. We're definitely talking about user experience. We are absolutely talking about usability <laughs> and user experience. Um, and we wanted to anchor it to something because uh, in past shows, uh, in many different uh, contexts, we've referenced Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think. And so yeah. we wanted to talk about that without exactly talking about it. But um, a lot of what we mentioned tonight is – um, structured around that book and we'll have a link to it in the yeah. show notes as well it, go pick up a copy of it if you haven't already um, but if any of this interests you the book is going to tell you more and teach you everything and you'll never have to do another thing again because it's a perfect shining <laughs> star in the sky <laughs> and i mean i know that sounds like like sales puffery but i mean the book well it's it, 18 years old come on 19 it, it is and and they and he really like makes amazon.com out to be this very really virtuous like paragon of usability and it's very different now than it was then however i think the principles and everything that he talks about in the book like have not changed no yeah uh and and it's still like it, the, the, i think the best thing about this book is how brief it is yeah it's it's something you could 
conceivably read in a single day and absorb, but also like refer back to occasionally. Lots of pictures. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Lots of, yeah, lots of illustrations too. And, uh, yeah, it's just, if you don't want to have a copy, I, I think it's in second or third edition now. Re- revisited, but it's third. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And here's, here's the, I think the bullet point on, on that thought is if you're going to read books, read books on concepts, not tools. Mm. You know, not mm-hmm. necessarily technology. Some technology, maybe, but generally, Methods and yeah. practices and concepts are the things that serve you over time. And that's why I think this book has held up so well because it is anchored so much in here's how to think about usability. Um, and it's a, and it's a yeah. very accessible, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> approach to that. Of all the books that I have read about web development, this is probably the one that I refer to the most often in the most different kinds of discussions. Um, Like even outside of web development, there's just some principles in this book are just so universally useful. Um, And it's really, it will open your eyes. If you're not already familiar with UX topics or usability, Um, it will be very eye opening for you. So definitely let's acknowledge the first elephant in the room, which is odds are you avid listener are not working somewhere that has a dedicated usability professional on your staff. <laughs> Probably Let, not. Let's just put that out there that most places don't have that. Big companies do generally. But, you know, small companies, you know, small firms, if you are maybe a contractor or a freelancer or you're working for businesses that have no web staff, you're you are the web staff. So, yeah. That that's entirely okay and you know I, I honestly think that that's i think we're so wrapped up in titles sometimes and we're so mm-hmm. attached to this idea that well this is a usability uh you know professional this is a user experience design expert or whatever um right you can be that but still be the other things um and, and or you can be I, a little I, bit of that and the other things and that's okay i would say that for most Like if you have, if you are a business that also has a website or a business that uses a website or something along those lines, you're probably fine with just having usability training or UX training for your staff, uh, unless you're the only web developer, in which which case you would be the person who has that. I think that if you're going to have a usability engineer or like a like specific UX expert of some kind, you probably are dealing with a very large and diverse market and, or you are doing like product innovation to where you're creating new things that require that expertise. Because if you're making a website and it's a pattern that it's already been done, as we will discuss later, um, chances are you just need someone who has awareness of these things. First and foremost, you know, if you're a front-end developer, if you're a designer, this is a great way to broaden your horizon and mm-hmm. and get a little bit outside of your comfort zone without like as a as somebody who is himself a front-end developer, I am a lousy designer. <laughs> and I I've, I've said it before and I never make any bones about it. Um I'm I'm shitty at any kind of artistic concepting, but Usability is an area I can expand into that is very much within my reach um, because yeah. it isn't that same skill set. It's not it's not in between being a developer and a designer. It is apart from it, and as such, yeah, uses talents that you know you don't have to have in common. And I think that you know that really helps in, you know in how you think about it. It. Like it uses aesthetics and it uses visual aspects as a medium, but it is not specifically aesthetic or visual. Um, it's it's more of a psychological thing, like understanding how your user thinks, how they interact with things, um, understanding how people have used sites in the past. It's it's not specifically a design visual design issue. I love construction metaphors in this space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. You know, being a carpenter versus an architect, 
enormously different skill sets that don't overlap in great ways. But Mm -hmm. you could be a carpenter that understands how to paint. Right. (laughs) That, That is adjacent enough to what you are doing. And, you know, it's not building, you know, it's not, it's not framing walls. It's not, you know, you know, running plumbing or electrical or things like that. But it is a finishing technique to your work. Okay, like I like that analogy. Of course you do. I and I, it. I, I'm gonna t- <laughs> take it one step further. I think that usability would inform a carpenter to know that, uh, for example, you don't want to have the sharp ends of nails sticking out after they've hammered through a board, or you don't want to have uh, the toilet seat like almost a butt with the wall in yeah. front of it. Because that's hard to use. It's it's understanding like the the application of what you're creating and how that will be used, and understanding just sort of like, does this make sense? How I'm doing or, this? You know, you think of it. Um, stairs. I think that's a good. Yeah. A, a designer comes in and says, "Okay, for this staircase, we need to have the ten stairs." And as you're building, you're like, "If I build ten stairs, they're going to be way too you know steep or shallow or yeah. you know they aren't going to be they aren't going to have the right rise to them." Right. And, the carpenter would understand, oh, no, we need to cut. You know, you've made that an inch too tall, so we need to adjust. Yeah. And then I will build it that way. The steps are still there. The staircase is still right. there. But you have dramatically, yeah. if you anybody who's ever tried to go up or down a staircase that is too steep or too shallow, you know what I'm talking about. That it, fe- it just, <laughs> it doesn't feel quite right when you're going up and down it. It doesn't stop you from right. going up and down it. You can still do it, <laughs> but... It definitely yeah. throws off your feeling about it. I like yeah, that one. I'm, I'm something... going to stick with that one when I talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> it it kind of pervades everything, uh, and uh, what, what's what, well that will become more evident. Yeah, when yeah. We talk more about um, it. And don't avoid this stuff either. Like, uh, there's I think yeah. this fear too that well, I'm a developer or you know I'm a designer. My expertise is in in those areas. I don't know usability. I don't know how to use or test. I don't have X, Y, or Z to mm-hmm. accomplish that. Um, and, and like you just said, this is going to become evident as we talk. Don't don't be afraid of that. Don't let mm-hmm. imposter syndrome get in the way of thinking that anything. If, yeah. It, <laughs> so what if you're especially this? You have to start right. somewhere. And one of the lessons out of the book is. Even if you don't really know what you're doing or how to do it, what you'll discover is that the biggest problems that exist with your users Mm -hmm. will be very obvious very quickly, and you don't have to dig or work for them very hard, usually. The finer details, sure, those will take experience and nuance, and you have to know how to ask the right questions. But you don't have to be there on day one. That's okay. One of the first, I think, run-ins with usability that I had was during a presentation when the presenter said, um, he showed, what happens if you, if you search on Google for click here? And the very first search result at the time, and probably still is, is Adobe Acrobat Reader. So like Google has associated the words click here with Acrobat Reader. And just think about, I, I don't think we should explain why. You think about why that is. (laughs) Why might the words click here be associated with Adobe Acrobat Reader? And that I think that there's a lesson in that. And that's the sort of thing, like that awareness and um, just kind of knowledge in general of like, oh, yeah, of course. That that's yeah. Don't confuse, too. There's there's also this piece that um, understanding your site means understanding your users. and mm-hmm. we get a lot of analytics every day. You know, if you use Google Analytics, you get yeah. a ton of data about your users. And that's good. It is informative, but it should not be used in place of usability. Yeah, no, you, definitely not. You can infer things in analytics. You know, I think you can predict things in analytics. But mm-hmm. the problem with analytics is that it only tells you what, when, and where. It it doesn't right. give you the why or the how. Yeah, if you have if you've got like 50% attrition... And your conversion funnels, you know, is that, are you losing users because they can't figure out how to use your form or using it because they just wanted a price check or like, you you don't know what the reasons are. Now it can be indicative of what you should ask questions about, Mm -hmm. you know, that can provide scent. We'll bring that phrase up later. Um, It can provide scent for 
identifying, well, maybe there's something here, let's dig into it. But you do need to do the test to fully understand that. When you get into, you know, things like, you know, well, I can build a funnel for it. I can make a goal for it. Um, look at all this mm -hmm. user demographic information I've got. It's very high level. You know, it's it's yeah. it's certainly macro. It's not micro. It is, you know, you can't pick out right. one person. And it becomes, that data therefore becomes very sterile um, in what it right. can inform. You, you really, like, you can only look at very high level view yeah. of what your users are doing. So rewind the clock. You know, we said <laughs> this book is 19 years old. Krug wrote this, the original wow. edition of this, um, which I had in 2000. Yeah. He did a, a second edition in 06, and then the, the revisited edition, which is, I, as far as I know, is the current version, was 2013. I think I have the first edition, but I think I bought it after the second edition was released. Didn't, didn't he make another book after that, though? Or right, yeah, 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 yeah. There's there's rock, this, rock, rocket surgery, yeah, right? The sibling book, yeah. So yeah, that came out after the second edition. Um, so don't okay. make me think came first, uh, and then rocket surgery made easy came in '09. Yeah, um, also a book I have, and also something that we're not going to talk a lot in this episode about, like the specifics of tests to do. That mm -hmm. is the book you want, though, if that's what you're looking for. I haven't read that yet. I'll, I'll need oh, to yeah. That no, out. it's it's I mean, it, it cool. is as uh, as um, generational as the don't make me think. Is. Awesome. You know, they go hand in hand and they they do inform each other because don't make me think is all about the principles, whereas rocket surgery made easy is all about the practice. So they're they're okay. very dovetailed books and maybe nice. you know if people like this episode and what we're doing here you know maybe we come back to that and review some of that as well i think is it will be quite useful yeah. one of one of the lessons though that come out of all of these whether you're reading rocket surgery or don't make me think um and the thing you need to get over i think if you're not on that team at a big company with a usability team and all of this stuff is that you don't need a lot you know use Usability yeah, testing yeah, is really not don't. a heavy practice. It it can feel intimidating if you've never done it before and if you don't know what you're testing for. But um, I I I don't have the book in front of me, but I I recall there being something like, uh, Krug says that with a usability test given to five users, you can get about eighty five percent of the problems in the domain that you're testing right. over. So um. So for for five users that you know you're looking at maybe an hour of time total. It, you know when it comes to statistical analysis and things like that, yeah, you need large data sets and whatnot to work with that. Yeah. But that's to get the the high level precision. Amazon yeah. is going to do tests yes. with thousands of people. I I've been fortunate enough actually yes. to be part of some of their usability testing on uh, ah, AWS. Cool. It's very nice. neat. They do everything remotely. They're testing me along with a ton of other people, though. But that's huh. because they are making very small changes that they hope, you know, in aggregate are going to make them a dollar per person, <laughs> you know, every right. month or something like that. Google does that, yeah. too. They they do um, A-B testing on search but Yeah, you can – but with very um, few people, you can still understand the picture. Put it this way. If you don't do it. If you don't get five users, then you're going to have some really easy, low-hanging fruit problems that are not being addressed. Here's, here's the thing. When it comes to testing, if you do test one person, you are doing mm -hmm. better. The quote yeah. from the book is literally that testing one user is 100% better than testing none. <laughs> not sure about the math on that, yeah. but yes. <laughs> And obviously, if you pick the wrong weird person, you may get, you know, a lot of noise in their results or whatever. But, you know, it's, what is it, every every journey begins with one step, whatever, yeah, whatever, like whatever platitude you want to throw out there about that. You know, it, it's that idea that anything is better than nothing. And even if that one person is a weird fringe case and, mm -hmm. you know, you... 
let's let's say, and here's this is a sort of a fringe case without it being like bizarre. Let's say you pick somebody at random and they happen to be colorblind, and you just don't mm. know it. They don't tell you, and their yeah. so their results are just weird, and you can't figure out why. Um, you're not honing yeah. in on that accessibility issue that's there. At least you've started that process to then figure out. Sure. Well, why does this? This isn't even in tune with what our hypothesis originally said. Yeah, it should generate questions. Right. It, yeah, it should get you to kind of reflect and you'll you'll become look at things. intuitive as to you know what mm-hmm. you know what you should ask more about basically. Yeah. They also you know besides not needing a lot of people, you don't need a lot of money or you know we've got at at work a like a device lab. It's yeah. got a bunch of tablets and phones and all of this, and that's great. You <laughs> don't need all of that. For the same reason, right? Just right. having anything is at least a start. Think about if you had... So you have a website, and you've only ever looked at it on the browser. But then one day you're at your friend's house, and they're using their iPad or something, and you bring up, like, oh, hey, check out the website that I've been building. And they load it, and it's like, well, what the hell? This looks terrible. Like because the the breakpoints are off, or whatever. It could be anything. Prior to that experience, you had no idea that that was a problem. But like with one single sample, you've suddenly stumbled upon a very big problem that a countable number of your users may have been experiencing. And the the thing here that I love too is like this isn't a new concept and and people you know people right. use it maybe as as an excuse and I if I remember I think there's even a section in don't make me think that goes into some of these like excuses and the answers to them um, but this idea <laughs> that well I don't have all the things this isn't new and it's it's not like weird um, Jacob Nielsen who of course is cited everywhere wrote mm. a study mm. in 1989 that went into how you do usability engineering on a discount. Um, Now, of course, in 1989, you know, the the focus was more on, you know, broader spectrum usability, product usability, things like that. Not so much websites, obviously, but... That's back when computers had a physical switch that you had to flip. And and only a green (laughs) screen. Right. Um, Of course, Rocket Surgery Made Easy is an entire book about how to do a test that is cheap and or free. I, I know that we're not going to talk in detail about it, but I think that we should talk about one kind of test so that you can get an idea for how simple this is to do and what, what it is. What do you think? Okay, pick it. Uh, card sorting? Okay, I like it. Very analog. Yeah, yeah. So you go to your local stationery store and you get like a stack of index cards. Wait, 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 though. What? Index cards cost money. A dollar? Okay, fine. I've got that up on the shelf. Good call. Yeah. Or take, you know, you could also just take some printer paper and cut it up into index card sized like rectangles. Okay. And then you just write down the names of the sections of your site or the names of your pages, whatever the whatever it is you're trying to group together. The question you're trying to answer here is what does the user associate with like what words does the user group together? And so we, jargon, I think, is the word you're yeah, going for, right? Yeah. We every industry, especially like if you're in any specialized, like, like let's say you're at a hospital, right? You know, you work for hospital websites. They are just rote with jargon and mm-hmm. medical ease. You know, seventy five year old grandma doesn't know those words. Right. Doesn't know. Don't. Doesn't know. Doesn't know. <laughs> I've got some verb tense there. That's weird. But. <laughs> Card sorting is all about let's let's sort out the jargon and figure out what are what words our users use. The the easiest way to apply this is to take the existing menu that you have, your top level menu items, home, about what programs, whatever. Uh and then you take your sections that would go underneath those and you all of those items you write down into separate cards, and then you have the users sit down at the table. And you say, like, okay, here are the top-level things. Organize everything underneath them. Or, better yet, just don't even give the top-level things and just give them the sub, sub-items and just say, like, group these together with the things that you think are similar. Yeah. And then write another card and put a label at the top of it, whatever you would call it. Very much it's, like 
it, it's <clears throat> mind mapping, right? It's, it's yeah. analog mind mapping. It's it's amazing. Like I have done this uh, for reals, and it's amazing. Like the insight that you get out of it, like because it will challenge your preconceptions about what you think your users know. <laughs> and you can even go like weirder with give them blank cards mm-hmm. and and the heading and say write down the things you think would be under that. Oh yeah, yes. And yeah. so let them generate words for you cuz again, now you are literally getting the user to tell you what words they use. Um yeah. man, when I was at uh at an event apart uh last year, mm-hmm. Crap, I can't remember the speaker now off the top of my head because it's I I didn't put it in the show notes because I didn't think about it. He, <laughs> he was doing a, a card sort with I think it was Nissan or Honda. Okay. And what they it was amazing what they found because of course they had the site in English and they had set up the English words, but the problem was that the English words didn't translate precisely enough. And mm-hmm. what they found was that the some of the international off, or uh, uh, audiences were really confused about things like I think it was like legroom. The way legroom was described huh. was a very confusing phrasing. And so by card sorting, they figured out oh these translations aren't right. So it's huh. you know, it's a it's a very meta sort of abstracted way to approach that taxonomy. But cool, they were able to identify that and realize. These people, they're all putting this under this other heading because <laughs> in English, we're translating it as cabin space or whatever. Oh. They're translating it as a measurement. Yeah. I wish I remembered the the example better than that, but huh. hopefully that, that conveys the general uh, idea. When I was in higher ed, um, we did card sorting and um, in, uh, incoming freshmen and freshmen – would regularly not know what bursar meant. Oh, good one. But but they would know what payments were or yeah. or tuition or paying or some something it's it's specifically around money. But that institutional language that if you work at high, in higher ed, you use it all the time and it's like, "Oh yeah, the bursar's office, you know, Kathy works down there." Registrar? And yeah, right, right. Those sorts of things, like your your newer the the people that your chancellor or president really wants you to encourage to come to your campus, they're not going to know those words, and that's going to be a bad experience for them. Or even like prospective student, mm-hmm. um, and returning student. That's one yeah. that has for years been uh, gone over in in the higher ed circles. That high school students see current student and say, "Yes, I am a current. Student. I'm a current student, right?" <laughs> Okay, so this is this is a really good, I think, general principle from this world is when your your site is using language or a perspective that is from your perspective as like the business or organization. Um, so like yes, current students means for you current students at your university. However, your users may interpret that differently, and and so. You want to look at your experience from the perspective, like empathize from the perspective of a different kind of user. I mean, that kind of outlines the ne- the next thing, which is why why does any of this matter? You know, why would you mm-hmm. care about taking the time to you know do a test or or, or any of this? Um, the example that don't make me think uses, and I, I like this, is this idea of good lighting in a store. What do you mean? Like, it, it, you go into, let's say you go into Walmart, and they've got the giant halogen lights. Everything can be seen. They've got these end caps <laughs> that are all lit up. Um, and right. then you go across town to the local discount store, and they've got half, you know, their fluorescent tubes are burnt out, and the oh, shelves okay. are shady. Like, you you feel that difference in lighting, and it makes it feel darker and dingier. Or or it just it creates uh, friction in the experience because you're when you're walking through that that discount store and you're like you're picking up drill bits or whatever and you have to like really hold it up up high so it gets the most amount of light to it so you can see if it has the sizes that you're looking for. Yeah, the example that always or the question that's always raised right is if I add a field to a form. Yeah, classic example. You add one field to a form, you can always argue that you reduce conversions because it increases the friction on the form. 
it, right. re- it increases complexity and it reduces the amount people want to interact. Let's say, though, you're working on a small scale. Let's say you get a dozen form submissions a month. Yeah. Not a good sample size. Right. And so somebody might look at that and argue, well, we made that change. We still got our dozen submissions. So clearly right. you're wrong. <laughs> the the way I describe it, I call it additive experience. Um, mm-hmm. So you can coin that term and credit that to me when you use it. <laughs> uh, don't make me think uses, I think, a better uh, phrase that is the reservoir of goodwill. Okay. And, and it's not about like the one thing. Experience, let, let's say on a scale of one. Yeah. Changing a field is 0.3. Okay. So... You added a field, it reduced the experience to 0.7. That still rounds up to 1, which means odds are people are going to do it. Okay, okay. But it also knows that if you do 0.3 and 0.3 and 0.3, right. you've now reduced your the reservoir of goodwill down to 0.1. It's, if you go to a, a vendor, you go to the store, like the example you were using earlier, you go there knowing, thinking, like, I need this thing. And I believe this person can sell it to me. And you walk in and you're looking around the store shelves. How, like, there, there is some number of bad experiences you could have that are just minor inconveniences to where you just be like, oh, I'm so sick of this. I'm just, I'm done. Yeah. And, the, and depending on how your day is going, that number could be big. It could be small. There is a number. When weather.com says, hey, we see you're using an ad blocker. How about you turn that <laughs> off? A lot of people are willing to say, no, just get the thing out of my face. (laughs) When you go to a news site and it says, hey, subscribe to our newsletter, dismiss that, and then a video starts playing. And they're like, here, not only is it playing, but we're giving you sound. You're like, fuck (laughs) you. Full volume. Get the fuck off my screen. I'm done. It's That is what additive experience means. Right. It's, It's that chipping away. And I've done it. And if... You're listening to this and you haven't done it. You're a liar that you've gone to a website and it's done something and you just said, and I, I do it with news. News is the mm. worst offender of this. I think that yeah. between the, the pop-ups, the ads, the videos, all of this, this stuff begging me to sign up there or get a subscription. I don't need you. I leave. I can read yeah. this story somewhere else. Right. And I'm not going to deal with that hassle. I, I find that it tends to happen a lot around things that are related to the monetization of content and uh or, or marketing conversions one one of those two and and i think that users expect users at least understand when you go to the site and there's a uh, like an interstitial pop up that says like subscribe to our newsletter or whatever and there's an obvious x you can just close it your users are going to be like like okay if it happens every time you load a page on the same site that's going to be annoying, and they're probably not going to stick around your site very long looking at stuff. But they'll understand why it's there. But you have to kind of weigh – that's something that benefits you. It's not really benefiting them. And you want the site to – more than half the time – I would even go higher than that, but at least more than half the time uh, be benefiting your user and not benefiting your marketing slash finance people. That, that's why it's user experience. Right. I mean, bottom line, it's not marketing experience. And obviously, your site has to make money. Your company has to make money. Your your thing has to be effective. But effectiveness is measured by how you balance that. Mm-hmm. If users like your brand, they will want to buy from you more often, and they will recommend more people to you. Yeah. Give them a good experience. The example I've used in the past, um, and I refer back to it because it is, it's just that good, is um, Cards Against Humanity. Oh, yeah. That yeah. their checkout and shopping experience itself is so smooth that I, I don't even think about it. And it doesn't it doesn't get in my way. <laughs> it's it, it does exactly what I need it to do and nothing more. Um, yeah. They don't beg me to buy other things. They don't recommend other stuff to me. They don't try to upsell me on anything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it is as perfect a shopping experience online as a user could ask for. And I think they deserve that credit for what they've done there. This isn't really usability related specifically, but there's that the whole conversation of the scarcity abundance duality, and and I think that when you view your users as scarce, then you will want to maximize the money you make off of them. 
But if you view them as an abundant thing, you'll be less likely to maximize and you'll just accept whatever interaction they want to have with you. And I think that the latter is the better user experience. And if you're trying to maximize everything out of your user, they'll wise up to that quickly and they'll, and they'll probably not come back, which then fulfills your expectation of them being scarce. And this may kill a potential future sponsor. <laughs> GoDaddy. Oh. If you've ever used GoDaddy and you want to know an experience, a shopping experience, a checkout experience that tries to upsell you at every corner and uh -huh. get in your way, there you go for comparison because I refuse to use GoDaddy. And so the usability result is I purchase my domains through Google Domains. Why? Because yeah. Google doesn't get in my way. Yeah, that is nice. Usability testing. It matters because we don't design things the way we use them. And yeah. this is, I think, the next frontier for design that we're not wait, to yet. Wait, I think you should say we don't design things the way our users use our them. Our users, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is basically what the entire chapter two of Don't Make Me Think is devoted to, that we design for the ideal. When we make a design, whether, and I don't care if you're at a company or you're a freelancer, you, you make something and you take it to a stakeholder. The stakeholder, yeah. A, isn't the user. Right. B, you're sitting in a meeting and they're choosing one of three designs. And then you iterate on that design and you're nitpicking it and you get it to be exactly what they want for their deliverable. Yeah. They aren't the user. Right. The, the, com the conversation, it's important to include the stakeholder, but it should not end with the stakeholder. At least not, at least not initially. Yeah. For a lot of cases, not all of them, mind you, yeah. some companies, some consultants, some design firms absolutely usable, use, do user testing on the designs, yeah. and that is fantastic. Most places don't because they don't have the time or the money, but yeah. the result is you start implementing a design that is this ideal that can't be attained because it's not the user's ideal, and no user right. is the same. Usability, and this doesn't need to be said, but usability obviously is a spectrum and a cycle. Right. It's not a finish line. Right. There's also um, uh, scanning versus reading. Right. Like, users, if your content isn't the actual answer that the user is looking for, they're not going to read it. They're going to scan it. And that means they're going to look at headings, boldface text, anything that stands out, pull quotes, etc., <laughs> And they're looking through those things to find out whether or not this text has what they're looking for. And you should accept that maybe this page or whatever isn't the, isn't what their user is looking for. And you should help them decide that as quickly as possible because that will be whether or not they ever want to come back to you again. <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of this idea that nobody reads the manual anymore, right? Right. They plug things in, turn it on, and if it's not automatically doing what they need, they just start pushing buttons. <laughs> and that you know that's the real world versus a website but th that's the truth is that nobody gets into those details and forms and we've already planned an episode on this so if this is something that interests you we are going to dig into form usability specifically mm -hmm. um in i think february but nice. this this idea that when you start layering instruction like literal instructions on the form and help text and all of this You've already lost your user because you're the one screwing up because you've designed it so badly you have to include those instructions. That's the idea. And what what happens is the user tries to I don't I don't like this word, satisfice. Sa so that wasn't a typo in the show notes. It's, it actually is satisficing. It's satisficing. That's that is what okay. it is called. Where they will take the first reasonable option. Oh, it's a portmanteau of satisfy and suffice. Yes. I got it. Uh so they will do the first thing that feels right, even if it isn't. And this okay. is where the card sort, you picked a very good analogy for that. Um, yeah. Card sorting matters a lot and something like satisficing because they're going to go down the funnel they think is right from a taxonomy standpoint, whether right. that's clicking a menu item or a button or, or a link or whatever the case may be, um, or interacting with something that they feel is right based on what they've seen on your page. Right. And that may not be right. Um, and so that's that's why this matters. You you need to know 
where they say, you know what? Nope, it's too much. This looks right. I'm hitting it. I think this is going to get me there. I'll be happy with it, maybe. <laughs> so I, I, if you're a web professional, you have probably heard at some point someone, whether it be at a client or a user, talk about the number of clicks that it takes to get to a thing. And and uh, actually, there was a movie. Um, I want to say it was Along Came a Spider. It was uh, some like a thriller crime drama kind of movie. But there was at the beginning, there was a like a private school and a bunch of kids are in the class all on computers. And the teacher is like, who can get to this site in the least number of clicks or something like that? And I always think about that whenever I hear this example. But um, don't don't make me think to me, at least, is best represented by this idea that it's not about the number of clicks that it takes to get from A to B. It's like, how much do you have to think? Like, how much friction is there on that journey? Yeah. What's the, the cognit cognitive load, I think, is... Uh, he, Krug talks about that, right? Yeah. Well, it, this all wraps into kind of this idea of, you know, even, you know, 2019, here we are, you know, basically 19 years into this revolution of web development, and we're still failing at a lot of stuff. And, and clicks are yeah. a good example of that, I think, because even today, we still get wrapped up in these debates of, well... That's the user has to click three times to get to that, you know, <laughs> that answer or whatever. Um, yeah. And the number does matter, but the number isn't the matter. Can I say don't, is that? Am I too drunk to say that? I don't know. <laughs> don't like, don't be wasteful. Like, don't intentionally make your user click more times than they need to. But if something takes, if they have to go through five different pages to get to the thing, but the choices are very easy and it's not difficult to do this the user isn't going to mind very much it's it's a but, bobsled track a bobsled track is long but it's very <laughs> smooth and and contoured <laughs> and designed to get that bobsled team from jamaica from the top to the bottom but it you know it doesn't take long it's not hard and generally right. you know the average person doesn't crash the right, average bobsledder right. doesn't crash <laughs> I would. The, the 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 example the counter example to this would be if you really want to have the least number of clicks, put every link to every page on the home page of your site. Problem solved. Every page is within one click. But I think if you even consider doing that, it's really obvious why that doesn't work. Yeah. And so you realize quickly If you don't you know, do it's because your page is now thirteen miles long. <laughs> right. You replaced click depth with physical page depth. Or Yeah. Dr. Like if you've ever looked at depth. if you ever looked at Craigslist, you know, Craigslist is very flat. The architecture is very flat. However, you don't have every ad ever on the homepage. It is organized. It's it's flat organized. But even like that, it's like things are sectioned off. You can scan it easily. They they make it work somehow. And even let's think about WordPress, right? And even the people who aren't using WordPress, we've we have we still in 2019 have this uh trope of either click here to do something or, or read more. <laughs> right. And we've known for years that that's, it's bad usability and it's bad accessibility, but we still do it. This, this goes back to the thing from earlier about Adobe, Adobe reader being number one for click here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but here's some, and I'm going to ask the question, but I'm going to say, let's save the answer, which is, yeah. is this a bad thing? Because what I'm going to throw out there is Jacob's law. Mm -hmm. it, it's a weird conflict of knowing what a bad clickable element is versus what the convention people, even if it's a bad convention, people know it. And so, so it's, it's an interesting conflict. And we've got a great example that we're going to talk about. I, I would say that the, um, and this isn't to answer it, but the, the, the click here issue, when you see that it's like, for me, it's kind of an eye roll moment, but it's like, it, it doesn't, it's not friction per se, but I think that one of the things that Krug describes to do with links is instead of saying click here or I guess read more, um, say like the highlighted link text should be describing what it is that the link goes to. So the article title or like specifically the action that you're performing by clicking on the link, you know, register now for this class. So the register now would be the link. And the irony there, right, is the overlap in 
wow, usability is now all of a sudden good search engine optimization. Yes. Who knew? Yeah. That's not accidental. Um, lo- the yeah. login thing is one that infuriates me. Evernote used to be terrible about this, that mm-hmm. sites will have a login link and a register link, and they are mm-hmm. so, so focused on getting people to register that yeah. they totally give the middle finger to the existing users who come to their page and need to log in. And how many times have you ended up on a page that's saying you click the button and you think you're getting ready to log in and they're like, sign up with your Google account or what, you know, whatever, give us a username and password and email. And you're like, I don't need my email to log in. <laughs> and you realize you, well, you're on the register page. So we discussed GitHub earlier. Um, if you're already a GitHub user, you need to do this in incognito mode, but go to GitHub's homepage. And what you see is, the register form, you know, pick a username, email, password, sign up for GitHub. The actual link to signing in, if you're an existing user, is in the top right. You have to click on sign in, which, but funny enough, right next to it, there's another link that's highlighted that says sign up. This so you, is exactly what I was going to say is <laughs> why have the sign up form with the sign up button above it? That's right. bad, bad juju for yeah. GitHub. Um, yeah. The other one was Facebook Messenger. And this is brand new, like in the last week, I noticed they rolled out an update to, on the website, anyway, not not the mobile app. But on the website, if you've got the messenger bar, the little mm. chats that pop up with your people, they've moved right. the close button into the upper corner. What? And it, it's a hover. So it used to be just in the name bar, the, the header bar of your chat. But now it's not there unless you hover. And that, to me, has immediately... And maybe it's muscle memory. Maybe you can contribute or uh, attribute some of that to to that. But huh. it's because the button is small. It's next to the settings icon or was the options icon. Um, it's not where it used to be. I've actually had a lot of problems closing out chats just incrementally. And again, none of this has stopped me from using it. But it's right. reducing that uh, that well of goodwill, right? Yeah. So verbosity. Um, I before I get too much deeper into that. Um, okay, we have to just acknowledge the fact that marketers love writing. Yeah, and the only people I know of that love writing more than marketers are content strategists. And content strategists are awesome, and we know some, and they're wonderful people. And this is not a, a knock against them. It, yeah, <laughs> this is in general. Uh, or let me let me maybe maybe I should rephrase that. Copywriters. Oh, okay. That that's maybe the more accurate assessment of that. Because most if you're a good content strategist, you you'll understand where we're coming from. Yeah. Oh, oh, all right. Let me in their defense. I'll, I'll speak in their defense. I think that copywriters want to say things effectively. I think that sometimes they are paid for a certain number of words or they're paid per word or Maybe they're not told how the content they write will be used or where it will be applied. And that that's a good one. Yeah. There was a, a tweet I saw earlier today uh about how we shouldn't be using flyers that were designed for print in digital media or other platforms. You should design different things for different platforms. And I think that the same thing applies here. If you're using, you know, copy that you would use for a magazine or print media. It doesn't work with the web. I'm genuinely not even sure that I've ever seen anything provided by a copywriter that was not edited by maybe not a CEO, Mm -hmm. but definitely somebody much higher level than them (laughs) because they didn't say things the way that those people thought they should. And that goes back to the jargon discussion. That goes back to the lexicon taxonomy that, oh, that we're not using these words. And even if the copywriter is totally in the right, yeah. Once the copy leaves their hands, they have no control over it. I I think if we happen to have any MBAs or business type folks listening, please trust your web people. You probably don't need all the content you think you need. The web the oh, web no. the web people will tell you you don't need a welcome page anymore. This isn't 1997. Well, my favorite my my <laughs> my, my favorite favorite. Sorry. My favorite catchphrase, the the Fenan catchphrase, do less better. Yes. And it applies in all things web related, including content writing. Yeah. Um, there is one area of failure 
and it's brought up in Krug's book. Um, mm-hmm. There, I have a shirt in my closet that outlines a argument that was had between myself and and a friend of mine and Jared Spool on this. Okay, and that has to do with breadcrumbs. Okay. And I've I've kind of grouped it into this idea of where we're failing because I think it's still an area of high contention, but I think it's incredibly fun, and I want to throw it out there. <laughs> the thing is, in, in Krug's book, he includes breadcrumbs as a point of what we call like scale direction and location. Okay. Knowing where you are because this idea of people don't hit websites from the homepage ah. nearly as much as they hit it from Facebook, it- search, social, whatever. In Krug's book, uh, just to divert momentarily, he calls it the trunk test. He says, imagine that you were, like, tased, thrown in the trunk of a car, and dropped off in the middle of your website. Would you be able to find your way out? <laughs> I'm really concerned about what he did before he became a usability <laughs> expert, frankly. What is his background? <laughs> what he And he outlines, like, you know, have have simple strings separated by carrots, bold the last one. And the argument that I have made that is in support of that is that it provides scent to the user. Mm -hmm. So when they, and we said this, we brought this phrase up earlier, this idea of of scent when you land on a page, being able to orient yourself and know, and the trunk test is all about that. Being able to determine, you know, what site am I on? Where am I on that site? What page is this? How do I, you know, get where I need to go from here if this isn't what I want? Mm -hmm. Um, That's what the trunk test is all about. And Krug's idea is that breadcrumbs help that. I think it should be said that Krug's original original publication was in the year 2000. And at at that point, breadcrumbs were the best way to do that. That is fair. Yeah. I will say that it is still in the 2013 edition. Maybe it shouldn't be now. Um, Yeah. But what I would argue is that it's a reservoir issue <laughs> that yeah. it provides that 0.1, percent of value to the user's mm-hmm. reservoir. Now, the counter argument and where uh, uh, Jared's uh, view of this comes from and totally valid is that in UIE's uh, research on using breadcrumbs and how it affects usability, they have found no measurable effect. Hmm. And I think that's valid. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can really see where both of them are coming from. I, I think that breadcrumbs might be. They take up space. Uh, not archaic. I don't know what the good analogy would be. They're just maybe just not necessary anymore or not as necessary as they were. But I, I think that the, I think that the spirit of what Krug was trying to say, even though he was focusing on implementation, the spirit was that you should always be aware of, or the user should not have cognitive load added with trying to figure out where the hell they are on your site. And one might even argue that it's a lot like instructions. Mm. That if you need breadcrumbs to help a user know where they are and convey where they are spatially on your website, maybe you've done a bad job with your information architecture in general that they can't orient themselves as soon as they hit that page. I suppose so. I I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I I think maybe maybe a good substitute for breadcrumbs would just be having a very obvious link to home, and then also a link to the immediate parent category above wherever you're at. I I don't I frequently find that I don't need to know the full like ancestry tree of the page that I'm on, which is what breadcrumbs would show, but I also like I would like to be able to go up one level. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's it's a it's complicated and that's why yeah. I'm kind of including it in this idea of how how is it twenty nineteen and we still don't really have a great answer to that. Oh, you know what's a bad implementation of Bregman Crumbs I've seen though? It was on the um I've seen this done in a few places, but the one I remember it the most because we used it for our wiki at a previous job was the Moin Moin wiki. And they the breadcrumbs there would be the history of all the pages you've looked at in chronological order or the the most recent five pages you've looked at. Oh, interesting. But, but not in terms of ancestry or anything because everything was flat. Like, like a very literal breadcrumb. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It was super confusing the first few times because we did try to implement like some ancestry hierarchy 
Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a frustrating example of breadcrumbs. But, and without going too far down the Amazon rabbit hole, um, they're one of the worst offenders there, in my opinion. And, and yeah. Amazon, I think, has a, a lot of bad usability that they afford through their profits. <laughs> Which is ironic, because in, don't make me think, Amazon is like, you know, that's the one that Krug keeps coming back to. And he even acknowledges, like, I realize that I keep citing Amazon because their design is so simplistic and effective. But again, this is from, you know, 19 years ago. Yeah. And the where and like where breadcrumbs factor into that is particularly because the breadcrumbs for any given item can change based mm. on how you got to them. So it's like right. a hybrid of, you know, tax 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 taxonomical <laughs> tax what, whatever that word is that I am now too <laughs> scotchy to to say Taxonom- out loud taxonomical. taxonomical um versus historical. Right. Um, and right. so it's like this weird hybrid of both of those that if you've come to it through one category, it looks one way versus another. So I, I, Amazon kind of makes up for it with just having a very, if their search bar was a, if their search bar was a person, it would be like a very accommodating and kind person who puts up with a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah. They, I, I think their usability lessons at this point are one of, what you can do with brute force. Yeah. It's basically. brute force usability, I think is what Amazon is. And it's yeah. it's a uh, strength of market mm-hmm. that helps them get away with that. But that's I think maybe the, down the, the road. Re- one of the reasons that Krug really likes Amazon, aside from the like kind of clean aesthetics of it, is that they they when you search for like shoes, for example, they give you very clear and obvious options to kind of drill down through that to find the kind of shoes. And I, if I recall, and this has been probably 15 years since I've looked at the book, but I think tennis shoes was the example he used specifically. Like, and not general tennis shoes, but like the kind you'd use when actually playing tennis. Because he cites like different kinds of surfaces that you might want to use them for. Right. And he was saying that that was one of the reasons why Amazon was so effective at the time was because they... they made it so that you had the cognitive load of making those decisions was very low. Yeah. And I, I think it's a very recent occurrence that that has changed dramatically. Yeah. Uh, and, and part of it is because of the addition of marketplace sellers. Oh yeah. Pol- Most definitely. It has polluted their taxonomy. Basically. Yeah. They, just, um, <laughs> they probably had taxonomy people and it's just like, look, we're, we're not firing you, but you're not going to do this anymore. It's just so, not even worth it. <laughs> so let's drive this all home by talking about like where we are applying usability, you know, in with modern mm. design and all of this and how it's working for us and how, cause I, I think part of this story is one of we are, as our industry itself matures and ages, we are kind of integrating a lot of this thinking Jacob's law, something right. we've mentioned a million times on this show um, comes to mind and it, it's i think in chapter three of don't make me think where he talks about the cars yeah and let's i want to go all the way back to the model t yeah most people have never driven a model t and don't know anything about it <laughs> has three pedals what car has three pedals standard transmission right what are those pedals clutch brake and gas you will break a model t sir don't ever get in one <laughs> that that those aren't the pedals in a model t what you are the pedals on the Model T? You, you want to know? I do. I do want to know. <laughs> Gear selector on the left, reverse pedal in the what? middle, and brake pedal on the right. How do you think you actually accelerate? None of those three are a gas pedal or an accelerometer or accelerator. Let go of brake. Nope. There's a lever that. on on the steering column. Oh. What's normally the lever on the steering column? The gear selector. Well, on the well, right. Well, yeah, yeah, on the right. What's the one on the left? Turn signal? Yeah. But yeah. that's not what it is on the uh, Model T. It's uh, it's called the timing stock. What? Because you, know, you can actively uh, retard the uh, timing on the distributor from the steering column based oh. on how lean or rich it's running or how cold or hot it is. So you have to control the timing. I feel like this is getting into a discussion about about good object-oriented design. <laughs> but it, it's all about this idea, right, that 
we have standardized on something. And yeah. since the 30s, we figured out, well, if we go clutch, brake, gas, that mm. works well. People understand how a gear shifter works. Now, gear shifters have changed. You've yeah. used a three on the tree versus a floor shifter, obviously different. Yeah. But by and large, especially now that we've entered the era of the automatic transmission, you have a brake, you have a gas, go. Yeah. We've changed a little bit from the the column shifter, park, drive, neutral, all that, to some cars now have the knob that you just turn. Right. But everything's labeled the same. It's all It all looks the same. The idea is they've tried to keep cars... Even it doesn't matter if you buy a Ford or a Chevy. Yeah. The the usability of the vehicle is inherently very standardized and normalized. I I would even go farther with that and say that they at some point there was consideration done about why it's clutch brake gas and why the clutch is so far to the left and why the gas is all the way to the right. And I think that they probably found through usability testing that if they put the gas anywhere but on the far right, then it creates, um, well, not cognitive load, but muscle load, because you have to keep your leg in a non-comfortable position to push on the pedal that you're probably using the most often. And here, let me melt your brain. Most people yeah. are right-handed. <laughs> right. I mean, that that's why the gas pedal is on the right. Um, so cars are part of that. This how this applies. So, like, think about it like this, right? The interface of the car, the steering mm -hmm. wheel, the the pedals, is very standardized. Motors are not. Right, right. It and that's the same for a website. You may have. There's a reason why header structure on web pages, yeah, is very consistent. Search, you know, boxes. The right. the main navigation elements, a logo. It may feel very homogenous and very boring. But it's because that is the anecdote that people identify with in terms yeah. of, you know, that, that, that mode. And that gets back to Jacob's Law, which is that people spend right. more time on other sites than do on yours. Yeah. So make your site work like other sites. And it doesn't matter if you're using, you know, WordPress and PHP or mm -hmm. .CMS and Java or, or Drupal, Typo3. Does anybody use Typo3 anymore? I don't know. But, <laughs> hey, if you do... The motor doesn't matter. Some people still yeah. drive, you know, Audis because I don't know why. Uh, Audis are nice cars. Not the old ones. Oh. Well, I guess the old ones kind of were too. Alfa Romeo, <laughs> that's the one. I've, oh, I had an okay. A in my head, but I wasn't okay. getting there real quick. <laughs> one other place where we are really succeeding in this, though, is um, with sectioning, right? Yes. Uh, Krug talks a lot about this idea of, like, when you scan pages – being able to cognitively break stuff up into sections right. is important to understanding what is on the page. And I think we've gotten very good at that. And mm -hmm. in to the point where we said in HTML5, we need a section element. Right. I, I'm and really glad they added that. Yeah, it, it's yeah. A, a, a markup presentation of the user's need, which I think is a really good way to approach how we build websites. And just a quick throwback to episode 18 with uh, Tatiana Mack uh, about font size. Make sure you're doing 16 pixel minimum. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> size matters, right? Right. You know that an H1 is usually really big. An H2 is a little smaller than that. An H3 is a little smaller than that. And then your your base font is yeah like you should be base sixteen and that's that's informational text at that point. You you should I mean you can override the sizes of your heading tags, but H one should always be bigger than H two and so on. The the idea though I mean that's important because to me like I hate web fonts. Yeah, they have empowered a lot, and they are going to empower more. Because mm -hmm. there are new web font standards on the way that let you control fonts in a much more granular way. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the name of, what is it, flexible fonts or elastic fonts or something. Um, those are both wrong, I'm pretty sure. But you can, <laughs> you, you can change the aspects of a font, like the right. length of leaders and things like that and, and serifs. But the idea is, uh, fuck, 
And I don't mean that in the way Drunken UX <laughs> uses it. <laughs> F-O-U-C. F-O-U-C. The flash of unstyled content. And web fonts are notorious for this because mm-hmm. you have to download them. They aren't system fonts. Yeah. They're a web font. They are something you need to download from that website. And odds are you don't already have it, so it's not cached. What happens is, you know, that flash of unstyled content is itself jarring. Yeah. And... With fonts in particular, different fonts, like if you, let's say you're using uh, uh, Gloom and Bloom that degrades to Arial, that degrades to Helvetica, that degrades to a sans serif font, the the general line height and, and uh, 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 letter form right. of the characters from Gloom and Bloom is not the same for Arial. Right. When that web font has to do the replacement, it causes things to move around the page. I haven't worked with, um, I, I mean, I've used web fonts, but I haven't done a lot with them. Is there a way to uh, preload them? Remember how uh, back when we have to use images for rollovers? Yeah. Remember that? Like we hover, you have a rollover class. There was a way that you could pre-cache them by like putting the images into the header head tag, I think. Or not, not not putting the images in, but putting references to the images in the head tag. I mean, not without slowing down your whole page, basically. Okay. Because web fonts are loaded in CSS. So, oh, yes, okay. you can certainly load that CSS in the header. But right. it all comes back to, I mean, CSS is generally loaded synchronously. Um, right. now, now you can, of course, do it asynchronously or defer it. But it doesn't change anything. Hmm. If you're loading it asynchronously or deferring it, then that just means you're not seeing it until the end. You're you're not blocking the loading of your page, yeah. but you're still causing that flash of unstyled content. Um, and the reason this is uh, an issue is because as humans, we're very good and fast at discerning spatial relationships. Right. Oh, yeah. And the text is jumping around on the page. Right. It immediately confuses our sense of what was that we were just looking at? Uh, that is really annoying. And if you need an example, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about or why it applies, um, we've had on past RTO episodes, uh, go search for the tag dark patterns. Right. And anytime, like, banner ads are super bad about this. Um, JavaScript banner, banner ads are way bad. That they load in the spaces that are zero height. Yeah. And they're somewhere you want to click. And then they pop into place right about the right time that you're trying to click on something <laughs> because there is that flash of unstyled content because the right. JavaScript is still loading. The DOM elements haven't rendered. And as soon as it does, it moves everything and it fucks up your whole experience. Both that, that works on multiple levels. Yeah. It F O U C is your. <laughs> yeah. And so this idea of nesting content and sizing is important because you want stuff to not do that, and you want that spa- the spatial relationships that, that stuff conveys to work. That's why mm-hmm. white space is so important. Yeah, um, definitely. Go back, go back years and years. You know, the HTML was just a document format basically, and it was designed to have long pages of text, whatever you needed. Mm-hmm. As designers, we've learned how important white space is to conveying meaning between sections. Right. That's the. Uh... That's the law of proximity, right? I think when things are closer together. I'll say yes them. because I haven't heard that, but I trust you. <laughs> I think that's the same, but <laughs> but that you know, that's why white space is so much more important to design now than it was, you know, ten years ago. We've right. learned. It's it's a human cognitive thing that white space affects our ability to relate things. Mm-hmm. Micro interactions. We're way better on them. Knowing what's clickable on a page. Oh, Con- okay. Conveying those little things that say this is an interactive element versus this is not. So that's something Kr- Krug says to when you're doing a link on the page, his advice is to always use blue text and have it be underlined. Underlined and I, and I, always. Yeah. I, I think that I'm, I'm on the fence about this. I think that in the year 2000, this that was a definite yes. I think because of Jacob's Law and because things are just so different now, I think as long as your as long as your links are clearly discernible as links, yeah, um, they don't need to necessarily be blue underlined anymore. 
But they it, need to be really obvious. Accessibility would say that you can change the color mm -hmm. if, yes, it's discernible, and it's underlined. The underline is the important part. Yeah. The underline is the thing that really distinguishes it because contrast isn't necessarily enough. I would I would agree with that. That, that hasn't changed and I think that you should never use, you should never underline text ever unless it's a link. P people still go search on Twitter for people mentioning underline and link. Yeah. It's still something people complain about. And I don't blame yeah. them because it is. The underline is the important part of the link. And in the, and it needs to not be like making it where when you hover over it, the underline shows up. That's not enough. It, it needs to be like, we're talking about scannability earlier. It needs to be visible when you're just scanning the page. These items are clickable. Yeah. The the flip side of this where we've gotten better is that we've also jettisoned the things that aren't important to usability. <laughs> My favorite, and it's the constant butt of jokes, is the blink tag. <laughs> now, why that ended up in the spec uh, ever, I don't know. That was one of those things where I think the developers initially said, like, we can do this, and they didn't think about it if they should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's probably some history there that would be fun to dig into that I just don't know. Yeah. But we discovered that the blink tag, A, it wasn't implemented consistently, and it was awful for users. Yeah. Um, because, you know, HTML is about marking up the the meaning of the document, not the behavior right. of the document. And but But back in the 90s, though, HTML what was about all the things we didn't have style sheets right we didn't have those things and so you're so you right had, we didn't have an alternative you had font tags and you had an underline tag and a strike through tag nowadays yeah. you would do both those things using your css and use span or whatever yeah that's fair but yeah that's i think the point is we realized yeah it's a there's a better way um and as developers right that we yeah. we figured out ways to improve that markup and usability in that way goes way beyond the presentation layer, I think, doesn't it? Yeah, I, th I would say so. I, I think that it uh, extend it kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It kind of it sneaks into all those different areas. Pra practice what subtly. you preach. <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind of yeah. the thing is, even as a developer, you can be practicing usability on things that people never see. Right. I, I've i been kind of harping on this for, I think, the past couple of years, the idea of extending the, the, the concept of cognitive load to what we do as developers. And we've all seen clever code. We've all seen, you know, giant blocks of code that when you go to look at them, it's like, what? And you have to really, like, think about what it's doing. And I, I think that that's, I think it's doing a disservice to our fellow program and to our future selves if we're the person maintaining it at the end of the day as a developer if we teach ourselves to write good code and document mm -hmm. that code so that other developers know how to use it we are inherently training ourselves to produce things that users can then make use of because sometimes your user isn't the grandma trying to buy a bell necklace for her cat i don't know uh <laughs> It's another developer trying to use the thing you wrote. Yeah, yeah. Having the, you know, the the optimization that you might get from writing a particularly concise block of code is web, with web, like if you're writing it in C or assembly or something, that matters. And I totally get it. But I think that those are anti-patterns in web. And I think that we should instead be focusing, even if it's backend code, focus on making the code maintainable because chances are it will be other people who have to maintain it. And the, the the level of optimization you're likely to get from a high-level language that you're going to use with web development is probably negligible. I mean, you know, if you have to do an algorithm or something that requires execution optimization, then whatever. But you can use lots of comments there or something. And I see it a lot with newer developers especially. Love using clever code. Uh, don't think enough about maintainability. So here's the takeaway. Yeah. Usability is about thinking about somebody other than yourself. Yes. Usability is about empathy. 
Yes, I would agree with both of those statements. That that <laughs> is what it is. That's why it matters. Um, so sit back, take a load off, and give us one minute, and we'll be right back to wrap up the show. The Drunken UX Podcast is brought to you by our friends at NewCloud. NewCloud is an industry-leading interactive map provider who has been building location-based solutions for organizations for a decade. Are you trying to find a simple solution to provide your users with an interactive map of your school, city, or business? Well, NewCloud's interactive map platform gives you the power to make and edit a custom interactive map in just minutes. They have a team of professional cartographers who specialize in map illustrations of many different styles and are ready to design an artistic rendering to fit your exact needs. One map serves all of your users' devices with responsive maps that are designed to scale and blend in seamlessly with your existing website. To request a demonstration or to view their portfolio, visit them online at newcloud.com slash drunkenux. That's nucloud.com slash drunkenux. Well, thanks for listening today. I was talking about this awesome book. Um, again, it's called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. There's three editions. What was the new one called? It's just, I think it's just Revisited. Revisited. Okay. Yeah. Get get the one from 20... I think it's it's either 2013 or 2014. I don't remember. We'll have a link in the show notes if you click through uh, drunkenux.com. Find this episode. There'll be a link in the show notes to it. You can pick it up from Amazon or from your local bookstore. If you have one, yeah, where about um, yeah a paperback it's, swap? I used to use. You remember paperback? I swap? remember that. Yeah, I still yeah. get little credits on them. Yeah, I don't know if I do or not. I don't know if I can log <laughs> in anymore. Um, <laughs> be sure to check us out: Facebook, Twitter uh, slash Drunken UX, or Instagram at slash Drunken UX Podcast. Um, you can hit us up on Slack. Let us know how you do usability testing or how you enjoyed the book or whatever. Um, DrunkenUX.com yeah. slash Slack will get you there. No problems, no troubles. Uh, stay tuned. We will be returning to real time overview shortly. Uh, new format, new times every other Monday in between episodes of this with build process roughly in the middle of the week. Uh, otherwise, I guess, man, I only have other one other um, thought, which is a I like fire and cane the more I have it. That's one <laughs> part of it. But the other is, folks, keep your personas close and your users closer. Bye bye. <laughs>